Welcome back, everyone, to this episode of the Becoming Immune Confident Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Carol Wada, board certified pediatric and adult allergy, immunology, lifestyle medicine doc, and autoimmune patient. And as I love welcoming some of my amazing colleagues and friends to the show. And this week, we have a real treat. Dr. Susan Baumgartel is an internal medicine physician with over 30 years of experience. She founded her business, My MD Advocate, in 2022, transitioning from inpatient clinical medicine to virtual medical advocacy arena. While in the 2020 pandemic, while it was raging, her innate creativity blossomed with the launching of Menopause Menu, a free resource and blog website providing nourishing support for menopause and beyond. Always a keen observer of the human condition and a lover of nature, Susan recognized her strengths as a storyteller and applied them to a variety of nonfiction writing venues. Her stories and essays have appeared online and in print on a variety of platforms. She also collaborates with people all over the globe via podcast, live stream events, lectures, and other venues. And she has just written her first book, which was released late this summer. It is called The Menopause Menu, From Hot Flashes to Delicious Dishes, A Symptom-Driven Nourishing Guide to Mastering Menopause. When not devoting time to writing or patient consultation, Susan can be found volunteering for Cancer Lifeline, a regional nonprofit, optimizing the quality of life for all people touched by cancer. She lives in Seattle with her husband of 32 years and is a proud mom to a daughter who is serving as an officer in the U.S. Navy. Susan, I'm so glad we were able to connect and find time to talk all about the amazing things you're doing. And in particular, focus a a little bit on some things that we love together, which is advocacy and spending some time in the kitchen, using food and nourishment in healing ways. Can you share a little bit more about your story, how you got into doing this work you're doing? Thank you for having me here. It's just a pleasure to chat with you and and to shoot the breeze, as they say. There's so many things I think that we intersect with, especially you you did you left out the intermix of holistic and evidence based uh-huh. principles together, and that's really has fueled my work for 30 years. I can't believe I've been a doctor for 30 years now. So I practiced clinical medicine forever, and uh, I, I pivoted, but in in a good way in terms of I needed a change. Uh, uh-huh. I didn't, I, I really love working for myself, frankly. I, I think it's just the, the cat's meow. And um, I realized that thinking about my menopause menu website, that I had so much more to offer. And I thought, gosh, there's a book there somewhere. That, of course, I don't think I could have done had I been in my previous um, position. So branching out, becoming an advocate. And really what I do is help people navigate systems I'm a consultant, so I'm still serving as an MD. I can really help them almost fill the gap. A lot of people are between doctors or not sure about where to go, or maybe they have chronic illness, chronic disease. I'm very attuned to that. And I know that's something that that is close to you as well. And to me, I feel like I can honor my experience, my expertise, and still be a value because I really connect with people one-on-one. I like that human rapport in that relationship. And it's just, it all came together last night, actually, with a bow on top when I had my book launch party to meet a lot of people in person, some of my colleagues, but certainly patients. And to me, that was, oh boy, tears of joy there. So I love what I do. And it's just been a fun journey. What led you to start your blog and your website? So that, uh, I guess I would call it my passion project. That was 2020, like the first year of the pandemic. I think everyone has a pandemic story, right? Yeah. I, really, I felt, gosh, I've got to do something or I'm going to just go out of, I'm going to go crazy. And I knew that I wanted to do something like that. So it was organic. And I knew I wanted it to be free. I wanted it to be for everyone. Initially, I put just for women, but it's really for all people. It's not just for women. But it really was a kind of like a hub, a, a place that you can come to under the information tab. There's 16 different sections and actually they correlate with chapters of my book. But then it was also fun. There's a blog, there's like videos, there's recipes. Of course, everything I do, there's food in it or flowers. I felt like it was a good place to put my creative energies that were squelched in my professional role. And the pandemic sure didn't help either. So 
it was an outlet and it was, it's nice that I can continue that now. So it wasn't just like a a one and done thing. (laughs) I'm curious if you have, and and this is just us chatting, but if you have a favorite recipe you've made lately, or maybe one in the book that you want to like mention. There is a, see, I'm going to have to put my glasses on because (laughs) I want to get the correct attribution here. So on Chapter three, or is it two? See, it's all blending together when you write a book. It is chapter three. Always trust your first instinct. The chapter on sleep disruption. And it's funny because one of my patients said, wait a minute, the title is Cheesy Veggie Quiche with a Hash Brown Crust. They first saw this and said, hell, I'm going to do this before bedtime. This is too complicated. And then they read, quote, short on sleep last night, no time for breakfast. This tasty quiche can be made ahead of time cut into single servings, kept in the fridge or frozen for a few weeks. Now your breakfast is ready in less than one minute in the microwave. The whole point Mm -hmm. is that you're tired. Maybe you haven't slept well. You want something fast. It has great protein. It has veggies in Uh it. And I really want, I put these on because I wanted to uh, give the correct attribution. And Dr. Heather Schultz is in your neck of the woods, I think. She's Midwest. And uh, this is her recipe. And so I just want to shout out to Dr. Schultz for her fantastic recipe that made it into my book. So that I have made about four times and I mix it up every time. You can put whatever you want. It doesn't have to be veggie. You can like toss in chunks of Canadian bacon if you want to. Uh, but it's so great because of the hash brown crust and it's yeah. just a crowd pleaser. <laughs> no, I'm going to have I'm gonna have to try that because my kiddos this past weekend, we happened to have some hash browns in the freezer that needed to be used up and they gobbled them up. So I am cautiously optimistic that maybe, especially if I put some cheese on it, that tends to be the way. You can dice up broccoli. You can dice up broccolini or broccoli. You can put the red bell peppers. You can put, I don't know if they like mushrooms. I love mushrooms. You can put tons of things that really taste good together. They're going to love it. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Oh, cool. And I could see even if someone were plant-based, you could easily maybe swap out like just egg in there too. And absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I think someone, I never set out to do it this way, but one of my colleagues actually said, Hey, this is pretty much a plant-based. I think, Oh, you're right. I think 15 of 16 recipes are basically. (laughs) You're like, I wasn't even trying and it's not that way. So talk with us a little bit more. We know about a little bit about chapter three, but how Tell us a little bit more about the menopause menu. and Yeah, so I set out, about. thank you. I set out to write a book that was going to be helpful for women who are perimenopause, menopause, and just maybe recently postmenopause. And I think I did accomplish that, but it really spans a, a wider audience and a wider range. As I was seeing last night at my little event, I had men there, not just women, but men as well. I think the youngest guy was 25-ish and the oldest was 81. And then women of all ages. And that really made my heart sing because I did want a resource for everyone. So that was the accomplishment. I also really didn't want a medical textbook. If you have to look up every third word, forget it. It's just too complicated. (laughs) Uh, I also didn't want to dumb it down. There's too much. Don't even get me started on those websites, the snake oil and the just the Hollywood. Oh, I can tell you everything. I, I didn't want I didn't want it in that venue either. So I wanted it mid range. Good advice, evidence-based with a kind of sprinkle of holistic, whimsical stuff. And if anyone knows me, they know that I love flowers. I love art. My late mother was an artist. And so, of course, I put her picture on the front cover of the book. So it had to have a look and the feel of those days gone by. People had those beautiful, we had beautiful art books on our coffee table. And so I wanted to create like a coffee table book where you just could open it up to any page could be page 49. And then you just maybe you only have five minutes. So you just look at it, maybe read a little bit and look at a picture and then you put it down, come back later. So it's not something you have to read in order. And um, I I think it worked out well. So I'm really pleased. (laughs) That's incredible. So one thing I'm realizing as I am ticking ever closer to my 40th birthday next spring is menopause has not been talked about. I don't know that my mom shared very much about it. I don't know that her mom shared much with her. They don't have a super close relationship. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. 
Oh boy, you're spot on. I'm I'm thinking I'm I'm getting really close to 60 now, so I'm at the other end of that spectrum, but I too think about when first of all, when my mother was going through menopause, I'm sure I was probably going through puberty. Oh my god, what holy spirit decided that was a good idea for households. <laughs> hormones, hormones. I, actually that'll probably be our house. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> even maybe now it's more in the limelight and people can talk about it. Even it's not it's not common talk. You don't just whip out talking about vaginal dryness or your periods changing or whatever. I do think that I'm seeing such a, a shift, a paradigm shift, even in the lay press. There's not a day goes by when you don't see something, and it could be the Washington Post or New York Times or some other national, international publication or journal. And it's about menopause, or maybe it's about menopause in the workplace. And I think that's fantastic. I do think it might get overdone at some point and people are like, oh, God, I'm sick of these articles of menopause. But I think for now, they are a, a, a great service to people because it allows a discussion and it allows a nuanced discussion too, because as we know, women go through this in a very different experience for different women. But there are some common themes. And I think it's nice to know, first of all, you're not alone, but it's also nice to know what to prepare for and how to balance it in the context of your work and your life and in your family too. Yeah. I'm thinking too, in general, about how the discussion of our periods, at least in my immediate family, is so different than what I grew up with. And I am hopeful and imagine it will continue the discussion as my kiddos get older. But growing up, periods, especially when I was the age that my girls are now, which is kindergarten and second grade, were very hush. I remember being on a family trip. We went down to my dad's parents' house and my mom must have had some sort of period problem. It was very hush. My (laughs) sister and I were very worried about mom. There was just this tense, secretive energy. My cousin was there who was a couple years older. I'm sure she knew it was up, but she didn't want to spill the beans about everything. And I contrast that now where my 20-month-old is one morning literally playing with tampons. Yep. (laughs) Very nice. Um, and, you know, having these conversations with my girls, so, you know, trying to keep things age appropriate, not right. over complicate things, but just say, this is part of life. This happens to mom every month. It doesn't, thankfully, it doesn't hurt for some people. They may, and you want to let me know these different things. And it's just a big nothing burger, so to speak. I feel like I'm, I personally, though, have lived that experience since I was, what, 12 or 13. So I, I, I got that under my belt. I suppose by the time they're getting ready for menopause, maybe I'll feel similarly. (laughs) I love the fact that your story says that we're normalizing our bodies and talking about our bodies, especially as women and to other women to be. It's interesting when I reflect on the industry, there there's a lot of self-help, a lot of books, a lot of support, a lot of love and kind of kinship for women who are trying to conceive or they're pregnant or they're going to deliver or they have babies. But you don't get that sense of uh, let's all come together and talk about it and support you when you're going through pre or peri or menopause. So I think that I hope to see more of that and more stories that are reflecting of uh, it's okay to talk about it because you're right. I think very few of us collectively, us have experiences where we've shared things with our mother or if we have an aunt or a much older sister, which I don't, we just keep it to yourself. And so I think as we see more of that generationally happen, my hope is that just this becomes a normal thing. Aging, we're just aging. We're all aging, right? And midlife, menopause is midlife. And there are a lot of things that happen in midlife and it's okay to talk about it. I recall it has been several years ago now, but one of the very first conversations I heard openly about menopause was on NPR. Someone was probably promoting their book at the time. And, and I've tried to look to see which one it may have been because in the in the subsequent years I've been like, oh, but I remember hearing that humans and orca whales are two of the species of the few species where there really is this um wisdom that's carried on for the culture 
from postmenopausal women and leaders yeah. within the societies, which I just found so cool. <laughs> oh, I think I read the same or maybe heard the same. I love that, by the way, because I'm in Seattle and yeah. surrounded by water and we have all these orca pods. And so very much, I think back in the sep- no, 1970s or probably 1980s, I remember adopting a whale. There's a program to support the, so you basically pay, I think it was $50 back in, or $100. And basically you got the certificate and it showed, and the whale's name was Blossom and she was in the J-pod. Should, they identify them by their dorsal fin. So I got this official certificate. I had forgotten about that long ago until recently when I thought, oh, I wonder whatever happened. Is, is Blo- Was Blossom a real name? So of course, Google, I'll be darned. Blossom, they think she's still around. She's like a grandmother by now. I was like, that's so cool. Yeah, that whale wisdom, women's wisdom. There's, there's a yeah. lot of analogies there. <laughs> yeah. It brings us back to that lost connection that we so are in with nature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. As I'm here in suburbia, although where I sit in my dining room slash office, I'm quite fortunate that it faces our backyard and there are a ton of chipmunks and little squirrels that live right out here because we have an oak tree and they love the acorns. So every once in a while while I'm recording or what have you, or on is maybe a Zoom that I'm a little less than excited about. (laughs) See, you know, some little rodent creature that probably is trying to bury or dig under our foundation. <laughs> in my book and in my practice and, and my life philosophy, I always think about ways to uh, improve stress management. And I do feel that stress plays a role in so many things. We could talk for days about autoimmune disorder, about chronic illness, about auto-inflammatory and autoimmune disorders, auto-inflammatory disorders, and menopause, of course. And I'm so happy in my home office. I have this big window. I'm on the second floor, which is really like third floor because of our topography. And there's just a bunch of trees. And every day I can get very distracted by the birds because there's either a little chickadee or the juncos or... Lately, there's been this shark shinned hawk family. I think they had baby, their fledglings. And so they're around. Of course, that means crows because they're interrogating them. And then, of course, the seagulls have to get in. And there's just literally, I'm in an aviary. And it's so fun because sometimes they really get going. And it's just, it pulls me out into that little realm. And then I can get right back into where I was. And I just had a little, it's like a little meditation moment without even trying. <laughs> That's wonderful. My kiddos have been very fortunate in their preschool daycare. Part of the education program for kids is once a week, they have a nature educator come in. And many times they're now teaching my husband, oh yeah, that's the chickadee. Oh, that's, oh, don't rake all the leaves because we need to protect some habitat for the salamanders. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So I have hope for our future generations, not only for our discussion about menopause, but also maybe reconnecting a little bit more with our outdoor spaces. Can only hope. (laughs) Very much. And in my um, professional career, I uh, developed a program called Mini for Change, which was a seven-year program that ran from 2012 through 2019. I shut it down because our organization was going to be taken over and I just wanted to close it in my terms. But it was really a a pleasure to have mostly women, but some men come in and work on weight management and actually turn more into a wellness program, morphed beautifully. And so I had naturopathic docs, acupuncturists, nutritionists, exercise physiologists, psychologists. We had so many things in this program. It was so robust. And a big theme of it was stress management. And a lot of it was I had Saturday morning walks in Discovery Park, which is a massive public piece of land. It's beautiful. So we had walking groups or just we had stress management workshops. And there are things that you didn't just apply to menopause, but absolutely can apply to menopause in terms of yeah. how to navigate stress. Of course, a lot of it was with trying to think about weight management, but it was to me just, I think, a sign of the times because I think a lot of people are focusing on that now, rightly. Absolutely. But I think you hit upon two, at least two key factors that just on the cusp of starting to pay attention attention more to the discussion about menopause, knowing that it's around the corner, are the weight, seeing some shifts there. Yeah. Bone health is something else that has certainly come to mind and hot flashes (laughs) and learning how to get through those. Yeah. No, I would say weight is often what many women are focused on and frustrated by but that's it's almost insidious because it can develop over time and certainly not go away or go away quickly. 
I think the bone health and lean muscle mass and worrying about where are we going to prevent osteoporosis, that's really front and center, especially the first five years when you're in, in early menopause, excuse me, early postmenopause. But yeah, hot flashes. Oh boy, as I'm th- sitting here with my sweater thinking, oh, I should just, you learn how to dress in layers. And yeah. one of the things in my book, which is, here's the glasses again, written by psychologist Cheryl Lehman. And it was the first chapter in hot flashes because of course, hot flashes is the first chapter. I put in the dessert section, how to ride the hot flash wave. And Dr. Lehman talks about imagining the hot flash. That step one describes how to do that. Step two, slow rhythm breathing. A lot of people know how to do box breathing and slow rhythm breathing. And then step three, waves in the beach, thinking about uh, each hot flash is a wave and repeating this three-step sequence as many times. And this will create a new response pattern that you can activate during an actual hot flash. And and you can read that quick and say, yeah, posh, but actually if you do it, it really, you gain control because one of the worst things about a hot flash is, oh my God, it's when I least expect it and I have no control over this puppy. You actually do. There are many things to reduce hot flashes. And when you're in one, it's not the end of the world, even though for a microsecond, it feels that way, but you can actually control it. And that to me is is very empowering. Absolutely. I just remember that little, that little taste of them in those first few days after delivering my kiddos, especially my girls, I, I assume maybe the estrogen drop was more precipitous. Oh man. <laughs> I thought I was septic for a minute there, which is what and you know, yeah, a little too much or whatever, but quite intense. And, but I would certainly see where those breathing techniques could be so vital. Do you have a particular chapter that you think would maybe surprise readers to find? I actually think, boy. I'm so in love with all chapters because when you write something, you you live and breathe it. Oh gosh, yeah. I would think it's the last chapter. Chapter 16 is about cancer. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that chapter because I wanted to include maybe addressing women's fears, perhaps, of cancer in midlife, also the estrogen question, but really to take that moment and pick apart what's the learning point, what's the most important thing to come away from. And I think really there are many points, but the big overriding theme was don't be panicked about menopause and cancer, but realize that when we talk about natural menopause, not surgical or drug-induced or chemo-induced, but natural menopause, late 40s, early 50s, that's pretty much midlife. What things should you be thinking about in midlife? You're screening for breast cancer. You're screening for colon cancer. You're getting a skin check for skin cancer. There are things you're still screening for cervical cancer. So there are things that are not suddenly worse what should be on your radar, because that's what it means to be paying attention to your health and taking care of yourself. I think folks may look at that and say, cancer, uh uh-oh. But I tried to make that in the flavor of sharing my wisdom as a good primary care doctor. And then of course I had to, glasses on, I had to figure out like what recipe I'm going to, everything's paired with the recipe. So I thought long and hard about what I was going to pair that recipe with. And I ended up with apricot and cherry cake. Yeah. Um, And so here's the introduction. Fresh fruit is always a good thing when it comes to cancer prevention. Think antioxidants. But how food looks and tastes is paramount when going through cancer treatment. Sometimes it's worth revisiting an old recipe and modernizing it to satisfy one's current tastes. This recipe is based on a family favorite for the 1960s, Pflaumenkuchen, which is German for plum cake. But it has apricots and cherries instead of plums. Um, cool picture. That's my oh, target. Beautiful. But the whole point was when you look at the recipe, you might be thrown because we're trained, all of us, not just in medicine, ooh, sugar and fat and all this stuff is not good for you. But it has sugar, has butter, has flour. But the whole point is enjoying it, having it taste delicious, having maybe close your eyes and have the memory of something beautiful, a cake that you enjoyed. And of course, the fruit on top is delicious. And visually, it's very beautiful. To me, that was just as important as saying, oh, a different recipe. Oh, this is really healthy for you because it has these properties because maybe it'll re-. But I think Absolutely. it might surprise people and, and I think maybe delight people too. Yes. 
And now I want to go make a cake. My daughter said, we love something that I have passed down and have kept the same. My mom and I used to always watch PBS cooking shows together on the weekends. And years ago, it was the Frugal Gourmet and Capriol, who I think was from Seattle, if I remember correctly, which was seems so... Um, so cool and chic compared to the cornfields of Illinois um, <laughs> because she used things like creme fraiche, which you couldn't find in a grocery store if your life depended on it where I grew up. But we've been watching America's Test Kitchen and Cook's Country and thinking about on the whole, we do try our best to eat a plant forward, Mediterranean inspired type diet. And yet we're also living our lives trying to promote the idea that no food is like a a bad food or just avoiding diet culture altogether. But last night we were watching an episode where they made this beautiful chocolate tart. And the girls were like, mommy, can we make that? And so I'm like, (laughs) like, we have all the ingredients except for the chocolate and the cream. We'll have to pick those up. So at the, I went, one of my secret not so secret love affairs is Aldi and they have some really great a lot of times European type products. So they are known to have like pretty good affordable chocolate. So I picked up some chocolate and some cream. So perhaps we will take a little cue from the plum cake. We'll have the chocolate, which has the antioxidants and just enjoy it. I love that because to me, nourishment is also the beauty and the enjoyment. It's not just the macronutrients and what's in the content. Plus you're creating new memories and you're going off of a memory together that you, so it's just, it's all just this warm fuzzy. I was going to mention, because I know both of us have Asian slash Caucasian households. And sometimes we draw on cultures that maybe aren't our primary culture. So for instance, when you think about the first chapter again, hot flashes, miso soup is the recipe. Very basic, probably anybody can make it. But you think about miso, soy, soybeans, phytoestrogens, phytonutrients, and then the tofu in there. Oh my gosh, that's just the isoflavones. And just even if they didn't have that delicious, nutritious content, the taste is good. And there's some seaweed and spinach and of course, green onions. And just that that salty broth is just to die for. So that I think is nice to weave into everyone's kind of consideration for what they might want to enjoy and see as nutritious. And oh yeah, it actually might help with certain things like hot flashes. And to consider because prior to meeting my now husband, um, I maybe had tried miso soup once when we went out to, you know, the local, the the place where we actually always went for prom dinners was like the Japanese steakhouse, right? Um, Because that's the fancy restaurant in medium-sized Midwestern cities. That probably would have been my only experience with it, but I would have never thought to probably make it right until then. And so what a cool introduction for folks who haven't had much exposure to foods outside of their comfort zone to push it a little bit and have something so like homey and delicious and nutritious. And I must say, he'd start laughing if he knows that we're talking about him. But there's there are two recipes in the book from him. And the other recipe is, oh gosh, can I find it in a pinch? The other recipe is on the mental health section. So there's a mental health, uh, gosh, that's so important with menopause. The recipe is Japanese style fried rice with salmon. And I don't know if you can see here. Oh my gosh. Yum. And so there's so much good stuff. Of course, the salmon makes it wonderful too. But to me, you think of fried rice, the typical fried, you just throw everything in there and fry it up and it's all greasy. You can make it a little less greasy and a little bit more thoughtful in terms of the components of it. Oh, it is just like soul food. If you're stressed, you just want some something quick that just is comforting. Yes. Oh, try this recipe. <laughs> and, and I'm not a huge hot pe- hot sauce fan, but just a little bit of hot sauce on there. They want here. You are the helper. Oh, you have two helpers. Yes. yes. This is Charlotte. She's my second grader. And Josie. Hold on. It. We're talking about food. I bet you We're guys. We're talking are about salmon fried rice. How does that sound? Because you girls like fried rice. We usually put a bag of frozen edamame that's already been shelled along with a bag of the frozen mixed veggies. And that's a like super quick weekend, weeknight meal. Yes. Go get it. Get some for your sister. Go get some mandarin oranges too. (laughs) They're in the fridge, in the cheese section. 
I love edamame. Oh, so good. Yeah. Well, I sense we're wrapping up, aren't we? Because you have you have many things that you're juggling. See, you are the the quintessential woman here. <laughs> we may leave that part in. We may cut it out. I'll leave to who knows? We'll find out. <laughs> well, it's it's real life here is the reality. And sometimes the babysitter is under the weather and we hope she feels better because that is no fun. I'm pretty sure you're going to leave all this in because your viewers, your listeners need to identify with you. And they just did. <laughs> nah. I, it was pretty funny. I was uh, trying to record a session um, with uh, Dr. Kate Mangona not that long ago. And it was right before dinner. And it is that time between four o'clock and eight o'clock that it really um, is just this stage of life. It's just a little hectic and Learn and to roll with it. May I give you a compliment? You have a wonderful grace about you that anything that comes your way, you just handle it. So keep that up. <laughs> My dad, oh, he is known for his sayings, but he, since I was little, was always like, just fake it till you make it. <laughs> and that too. <laughs> no? And so that's always just, you just, you know. To a point, but where where can people connect with you? Where should they where should they pick up your book? Where can they read your writing? I know you've published some things on Kevin MD, but share away, and we'll put all the links in the show notes as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I have my own website, menopausemenu.com. And that's where I do a lot of my blogging. That includes written blogs, videos, which are not always mine. It could be podcasts and also recipes, and that has information. I have my professional website, which is mymdadvocate.com, which has links to other things as well. There's a lot of content on there, but the main kind of public, hey, this is fun website is Menopause Menu. And then of course my book, which sounds very familiar, it's called The Menopause Menu, is available on Amazon. And I'm actually the publisher as well. So it's not under a big publishing house. And I'm really, I'm honored that I can have it out there and available for everyone to enjoy. Ah, and that's, I was already super excited to talk with you about this and to help spread the word and everything, but also taking notes along the way as, as we've talked in the background about some other projects um, that we're slowly collaborating on. So this is so exciting, so inspiring, and it's oh, I know it's already helping so many people, but it really is going to be just continue to do. Thank you. It was a really pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh my it. gosh, it was my pleasure. This is so fun, and I'm glad we got to chat more, and I'm sure we will again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Susan. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. If you are loving this mix of self-discovery and science found here on the Becoming Immune Confident podcast, I'd love to invite you to sign up for my email list. Hop over to drcarawada.com and hit subscribe to ensure you don't miss out on any insights into new immune system science or how we can harness healing through our daily habits. Are you ready to feel confident, energized, and more like that BA that you used to be, here's how we can work together. Jennifer, an autoimmune dietitian, and I, board-certified immunologist, have put together the one and only Becoming Immune Confident comprehensive course, coaching, and community membership. What we do is we help women with misbehaving immune systems reclaim control over their health while minimizing fatigue, fog, and pain, all caused from too much inflammation. So if you are ready to have confidence and clarity around your immune system health and a sense of certainty, knowing that you are doing the best for your health and the health of your family, hop over to immuneconfident.com for details on how we can work together. We can't wait to connect. Before we wrap up today's episode, I want to take a quick moment to ask for your support. If you're enjoying the content of the Becoming Immune Confident podcast we're bringing you week after week, there's a simple but incredibly impactful way you can show your appreciation. You see, leaving a review is like giving us a virtual high five, and it helps our podcast reach even more people who could benefit from the valuable insights, entertainment, and inspiration we strive to provide week after week. So if you're finding value in what you hear, here's what you can do. 
Open up your podcast app, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other platform, and give us a glowing five-star review. We're dedicated to bringing you the best, and your feedback helps us fine-tune our content to suit your interests and needs. But hey, don't stop there. If you have a moment, leaving a few kind words in the review section goes a long way too. Share what you love about the podcast, your favorite episodes, or how it's made a positive impact on your life. Your words not only brighten our day, but they also encourage others to join our incredible community. Remember, every five-star review and every word of encouragement counts. It's like fuel to keep us creating, innovating, and striving to make your listening experience even better. So if you're up for it, show us some love by leaving us that virtual high five in the form of a five-star review today. And a huge shout out to all of you who have already taken the time to do so. You rock. Thank you for being a part of our podcast journey. And we can't wait to keep bringing you more amazing episodes in the future. Until next time, keep shining and keep listening and keep on building that confidence in yourself and your immune system health. Take care.